know God, love God, and serve God. We need to know who we are, love one another, and serve one another. be wielding the sword of the Word of God like Jesus Christ did when He was in the wilderness and the devil came to take Him out. I thank God that He's going to answer every prayer that was prayed in this altar this morning. Amen. Come on, where's your faith? Can, can you say amen better than that? Every request that is in His will, He will do. That's what the Word of God says. He says, where two agree is touching anything, He says He will do it. Amen. He says, whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified. Now, we pray today in the name of Jesus. We ask the Father in the name of Jesus. Look at this verse 36. Ushers, y'all can come and prepare to receive your offering as I read this. Amen? But it says, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? So what is the greatest commandment of all in the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all of the law and the prophets. Everything you could ever understand about the Bible has to be understood within the context of these two commandments. Everything written in the Bible is about how to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and how to love one another. In fact, when you're giving this morning, it's love that should be motivating you to give. Faith that worketh by love. Faith that moves because you love God. And he says, if you love me, you keep my commandments. You read the Word of God, you find out what the Word of God says, and you do what the Word of God says because you love God. Amen? Amen. Everything we do should be motivated by love. Not by self. Amen. See, that self-love is called eros love. It's a Greek word. It means I love you only because of what I can get from you. How many of y'all love God for only what you can get from God? Or do you love God for who He is? Amen. See, human love, that selfish love, has a hook in it. Always has an agenda. God's love is straight. God loves you in spite of you. God knows everything about you and loves you anyway. Isn't that good news? He's not loving you any more or any less because of what you do or don't do. He loves you right now with a perfect love, and He's never going to love you any more than He loves you right now. Now, you have to respond to that love today. Amen? That's the God kind of love. That's agape love. Amen? So every time you do what God says to you to do, you're loving Him. He said, if you love me, you keep my commandments. And it's not just a bunch of rules and regulations. I'm not talking about rules. I'm talking about when the Holy Spirit prompts you to do something or not to do something, to be sensitive enough to say yes or no to what the Holy Spirit is leading you to do or not do. Amen. It's not about what the preacher says or the law that a church gives you. It's about God living on the inside of you and speaking to you and leading you and guiding you. Amen. Amen. You know, whenever I struggled with cigarettes, that's how I quit. I realized that God told me one day I went to light a cigarette. He says, it's time for you to stop that, quit that. Now, that's what he told me. It wasn't the preacher that told me, because every time the preacher told me, it just made me mad. It wasn't because somebody else told me. But I was just going down the road, and I went to light up my Marlboro, and the witness of the Spirit on the inside said, okay, you've overcome this, you've overcome that, you've overcome this, now I'm going to help you overcome that. It's time for you to give that to me, give that up. And I realized that if I'm going to keep what he's commanding me to do, would be loving him. So it was like when he asked Peter, he says, do you love me more than these? He asked Peter that Three times. Peter was fishing that day. He said, do you love me more than these? And it was like that in my heart. Do you love me more than these? And so I realized that if I did smoke, he wasn't condemning me. But when I didn't, I was actually showing God I loved him more than I ever did. And I got delivered from that out of love, not out of law. Somebody say amen. amen. Y'all see the difference between love and law? 
But we got a lot of people that think they're the law uh, people of the church, the, the legalistic people. They want to walk around and point out everybody's faults. You know, they, they measure the skirt line or the haircut or the dress, and they're always looking at the outward appearance. Amen? Then when it's time to volunteer, they never show up. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me talk to the other side over here. But every time you're asking for a volunteer, that old boy shows up, and he's still struggling with a little bit of smoking with his cigarettes, and he might have to slip around the back of the church and get him a smoke every now and then. I'm sure when he gets to heaven, and he's standing there, and St. Peter looks at him like the joke would go, okay? He says, I'm sorry. You can't get in. I see that pack of Marlboros. And here's the legalistic one. I knew he, I knew he was going to see it. I'm so glad you saw it. No. See, that's legalism. And if we're going to be legalistic, let's take the law all the way. If we take it all the way, none of us are able. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Everybody still struggles with things. But the way to get delivered is not by the law, but by the law of love. Amen? So I go visit my mama once a week, at least. I try to. And it's not because it's a law. And it's not because if I don't go, she's going to manipulate me and call, oh, you didn't come see me this week. No, I do it because I love her and she loves me. So I make it a point to try once a week to go by and have coffee or just visit with her. Even if it's 10 minutes and I'm in a hurry and I'm just passing by, or we get to spend more time together. It's not a law. It's love. Now, you have me ever heard people talk about praying? The Bible says, could you not tarry with me one hour? So you got your great legalistic prayer warriors that pray like one or two hours a day, and they do it by the law. They do it by a clock, you know. Whenever they start praying, they look at the clock. It's 6 o'clock, and they say, now nah, I'm going to pray till 7. And they watch. They pray. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. 7 o'clock. It's over with. And then they come to you and say, well, how much do you pray a day? Y'all see the difference? One prays because it's a law. The other one prays because they love God. I've had more times when I was just going to go talk to God for 10 minutes that turned into two hours. Then having a, and I wasn't watching the clock. I was on my face before God. Amen. Having an encounter with God, and all of a sudden time didn't matter. I was in relationship, not in law. Amen. Go to Matthew chapter 16 this morning. I'll try to keep this short, only about two hours. <laughs> you know, new people are people y'all invite do. They ask, how long is church over there? They ever ask you that? As long as it takes. I don't know how long it's going to take. No, it's usually about an hour and a half to, no, well, usually about an hour and 45 minutes. But, uh, praise God. Look at verse 24. In uh, Matthew chapter 16, this is where Simon Peter says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He gets the revelation of who Jesus Christ is. And Jesus turns to him and he says, Peter, he says, Upon this rock of the revelation of who I am that you've received, I'm going to build my church. And then he goes on, and uh, as you know, the story goes that Peter ends up putting his foot in his mouth. He tries to rebuke the Lord in verses 21 uh, and following, and the Lord actually turns to Peter and says, Get behind me, Satan, for you're not mindful of the things of God, but the things of man. But then in verse 24, he says this, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. So when you're going to serve, you're going to have to deny yourself. You're going to have to say no to your own comfort zone and make yourself available to serve others. If it's all about you, all about you, you'll never do anything to help anybody else. Or you'll do things for others just for what you can get about, out of it. Again, it's that eros love thing. It's that self-centered love, man kind of love instead of agape love. See, the rewards that we get for serving like they did yesterday is not just y'all clapping hands and saying, look how spiritual they are. They didn't do it for that. In fact, they probably would have preferred me not even bringing them up because they do it in secret, God rewards them openly. But I do want to say thank you for everyone that serves. And there's so much serving that goes on that people don't see. 
but God sees. Amen? He says, let, them deny him, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. In other words, you give up your life to do the will of God. Where you're saying, not my will, but thy will be done, Lord. I'm giving my life. That's your time. We're living life together right now. So when you give your time, you're denying yourself. You're actually losing your life for his sake. And look at verse 26. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? What is the price? What is the price of your soul? You know, most people believe everything has a price. Amen? I'll show you this, a picture of this in the book of Genesis. Go to Genesis chapter 34. Father, I pray for your anointing to be upon me and every ear in this church. Touch every heart and every mind. Lord Jesus, you are the true teacher. Holy Spirit, you are the teacher. You lead us and guide us into all the truth. Lord, help me to open up your word where it will change people's lives today. In my weakness, Lord, be made strong, I pray, in Jesus' name. Chapter 34 of Genesis. Now, as you're turning there, let me uh, just mention something. Anybody ever saw or heard about the Great Wall of China? This wall is some 1,400 miles long. That's a long wall, isn't it? For us to understand, that would be like going from Maine all the way to Miami. And they built this wall. I don't know when it was built. But if they could build a wall like that back then, they sure could probably close off our borders if they really wanted to, don't you think? Well, that's a whole nother story. Okay, they built a wall to keep people out and to keep people in. This wall is in some places 25 foot wide up to other places where it's about 40 foot wide. Several stories high. It's a huge Ephesus. It can be seen from space. People out in the space station sometimes can actually see the wall of China from space. It's one of the seven wonders of the world. But in the first hundred years after it was built, the enemy was able to penetrate the wall three times. So evidently the wall didn't do what it was supposed to. It was strong. It was made out of rock. It, it, it was physically strong. But you know how they penetrated the wall? They bribed the guards at the gate. That's how they got in. So it didn't matter how strong the outward was. It's how strong the inward is that's what's important. And we can always put on a good strong outside, but what's really going on on the inside? So there was a price that the countrymen would receive that they would give up so that the enemy could penetrate the wall. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? What is the price? Where is it? That you're going to say, that's it, that's enough, and you're going to lie, or you're going to cheat, or you're going to purposely go the opposite direction of the will of God for your life. People do it all the time. They sit down and they raise their hand and they say, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. And how many know they don't always tell the truth? They say what they need to say to get what they want. That's humanism. See, as Christians, we've got to get back to integrity. Our strength is only as deep as our character is. Amen. So three different occasions, they bribed the guards and they're able to get through the gate. I don't know how much they paid them. You know, it's like they'd sneak up that night and says, listen, next Thursday night, we're going to come with the troops and you, we want you to be working. You're going to let us in. And, you know, so how much you need? Well, uh, give me a hundred bucks and I'll open the gate. Oh, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't turn over my, not, not for a hundred. Well, give me a million bucks, then I'll open the gate. Boy, I can do a lot with a million. You know, there was a, a young lady from the UK that put her virginity for sale on the internet. How many of y'all heard about that? 
through some organization, and it was going through eBay. And do you know that the bid was over $7 million? What a reaction. But what would we do to give up our purity? What is the price for us? Is it the love of money, the love of pleasure? Whatever it is. See, we've we got to start looking inside. If you want to be strong, your strength starts on the inside. It starts with the character that's on the inside of you. Amen. Now, in this story, if you want to mark it in your Bible, I'm going to be telling the story starting from chapter 33, actually, in verse 17, and going all the way through uh, chapter 34. Now, I'm a much better storyteller than I am a reader. So I know the story, and I'm going to just tell you the story, and you can call it, kind of follow along, okay? But right here, Jacob and Esau, his brother, just finished making peace. Esau goes his way, and Jacob's supposed to be going to the promised land. Say the promised land. That's going into the place that God has for him, the will of God for him. But when he takes off, he ends up, starting with verse 17, he goes to Succoth. And there he builds himself a house. And he, he, he doesn't go all the way into the promised land. He decides he's going to stop a little while and, 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 and take it easy. And there he builds him a house. And, and the place is called Succoth, which means the a city of tents or booths. Okay? Then after that, he dwelled there a little while. Then it says he goes to the uh, city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan. And there he ends up pitching a tent, and he, he's staying right out of the city of Shechem. And he stops there, and he builds an altar. He buys a piece of land there for 100 pieces of silver, and he builds an altar, and he worships God. And he calls the place, what does he call it uh, in verse 20? It says, El El Ho Israel. Now, once he's parked right there, he's still not where God wants him to be yet. And this message today is, what happens when we live on the fringe? Instead of living in the promises of God or all the way giving ourselves to the kingdom of God, we kind of live on the edge, living life on the edge. When we live our lives on the edge, it affects our lives, it affects our families, it affects our children, it affects our community. Now in verse 1 of the next chapter, it says, Dinah, the daughter of Leah... And if you know the story, Jacob has two wives. One is Rachel and the other one's Leah. Rachel is the pretty wife and Leah is not the so pretty wife. How many of you know the story? He woke up one morning, he thought he was with Rachel and he was with the wrong daughter. And so he loved Rachel more, it says, the Bible says, that she was the attractive one or the pretty one. But Leah gave him more sons and gave him a daughter. Now, I like to look up names to find out what they mean when we're studying like this. Leah means a wild cow. That's what her name means. What a name. So in English, we would say, hey, wild cow, how are you doing today? It's just like saying Abraham, say, hey, father of many nations. Okay? Dinah, her name means one who judges. Okay, but it says now Donna, the daughter of Leah, the one who judges the daughter of the wild cow. <laughs> I mean, it makes it more interesting when you look these names up, doesn't it? Now, you got to understand that, that Donna was, was affected by this because, you know, Jacob liked Rachel more, so she would see her mom get rejected. And then she was like the only daughter that we know of, of Jacob, and Jacob had 12 sons. So how many of you would like to be the daughter of a father who had 12 sons, of the mother in that relationship that really wasn't the one he liked? And now Jacob, instead of going into the promised land, he's living on the fringe. He's on the edge of it. And so what does she do one day? It says, the daughter of Leah, whom... He had bore to, that she had bore to Jacob, went to see the daughters of the land. So she's going to check out the other women of that land. And you know, back then, they were not supposed to uh, be unequally yoked. 
They were not supposed to go and, and encounter the other people in their customs. But she gets out of there, and she's going to check it out. I mean, in our days, like, okay, you move in by the city, and, and you're a Christian, but, you know, she's going to go see what the heathens are doing. The daughter wants to go party with the other women. So whenever she gets in the, there, she, she meets him. But as soon as she meets the daughters of the land, the next thing she does, she meets Shechem. And Shechem is the son of uh, Hamor. Now, Hamor is the, the father of all of this. Shechem is the name of the city. And here is the man. This is the, the son in which the city is named after, Shechem. So he's the prince of the land, and that's what it says. He is the guy that's got a chariot with, you know, with the chrome re- wheels on it. You know? He's the prince. Now, now, get this. His name means shoulder or hunk of meat. Now, now, you know, let's kind of play on this a little bit. So he's a hunk. Okay? He's the prince. He's the man. And here she is. She's already close to the world and to the heathen part of the world. These were not, these were not Israelites. They were Hittites. Okay? And so... She goes, and whenever she goes to see the daughter, she ends up seeing Shechem. And next thing you know, Shechem violates her. That meant she gave up her virginity to him. And it doesn't mean, if you look it up and you read the story, it doesn't mean he raped her. She was seeking to be there just as much as he was seeking for another woman. So they met some kind of way, and he violated her. And look at verse 3. His soul was strongly attracted to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the woman and spoke kindly to the young woman. But we're talking about love at first sight, huh? That's real fast. She takes off. She goes to see the women. The next thing you know, she's in bed with the prince. Now, y'all need to know something, that Jacob had his name changed to Israel. Say Israel. Israel. You know what Israel means? Prince of God. So Israel is a prince, and this is his princess. And he, but instead of being the princess of Israel, now she's becoming the princess of Shechem and those people. Now what am I saying? If we start living close to the edge as parents, as people, our children are going to be, they're going to tend to slide on over and create relationships and get into some positions that we don't want them to be in. Come on, parents. We can't send mixed messages. You know, you're going to be a Christian, do your best to be a Christian. But if you're going to be a Christian and a worldly person, don't get all upset if you see your children sliding off to the worldly side. Amen. Amen. So Shechem spoke to his father, saying, this is after this all happened. He said, get me this young woman as a wife. Now, you know, uh, Hamor right here, he's the man. He's the father. He's like the king. Shechem's the prince. And he says, I want that woman. Now, how many know you can get in trouble if you give your children everything they want? Come on, parents. Some of y'all give them, y'all trying to win their love instead of giving them guidelines. You try to give them everything they want. And you know what happens? Hamor goes to talk to Jacob about how to get uh, Dinah to be the wife of Shechem. So he's going to try to give his son everything he wants. And let me tell you, it doesn't work. Whenever your son gets or your, your children get in trouble, sometimes you've got to let them reap what they sow. Amen? Amen? If every time you pay them out or get them out of trouble, they just get deeper and deeper in trouble, then one day they're in jail. And you're not able to get them out of trouble because they went too deep into trouble. Amen. Now, this story, this story is... is, is and, uh, hey, Moore, let me tell you what his name means. I'm afraid to tell you what his name means. I looked it up in the dictionary. Now, y'all don't leave the church when I say this. This was actually in the dictionary, okay? And if you have a dictionary in your Bible that has got names in the front, you can go look at it. 
It, it says hey more, and then on the side it says dash means, and it was A, and I'll let you fill in the last two letters. <laughs> but we know he's talking about donkey. Amen? But that's what, it's, that's what it said. I was reading. I was like, whoa. He was a donkey. But in the old language, they didn't use the word donkey. Amen? So, so the old dictionaries, it was pretty interesting to find out that Shechem's dad was a donkey. <laughs> stubborn. Amen? I mean, come on, fathers. You're not supposed to be stubborn. So Shechem spoke to his father, <laughs> to his donkey of a dad, and said, Give me this young, excuse me, this young woman as a wife. And Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter. Now his sons, that's his 12 sons, were uh, with the livestock in the field. So Jacob heard this. He, he held his peace until they came. Now Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. So he was going to go try to get this done for his son. Amen? And the sons of Jacob came in from the field. When they heard it, the men were grieved and very angry because he had done this disgraceful thing in Israel and lied with Jacob's daughter, a thing which ought not to have been done. Somebody say amen. amen. This should not have been done. And Hamor spoke with them, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longs for, you, for your daughter. Please give her to him as a wife. And make marriages with us. And give your daughters to us. And take our daughters to yourselves. So you shall dwell in the land with us. And the land shall be before you. Dwell and trade in it. And acquire possessions for yourself in it. Then Shechem said to her father, to Jacob, he's talking to Jacob, and to her brothers, Let me find favor in your eyes, and whatever you say to me, I will give you. Ask me whatever, he says, ask me ever so much dowry or gift, and I will give according to what you say to me. But give me the young woman as a wife. Boy, he wanted her. Now he says, now how much I got to do to pay y'all off? That's what he's saying. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? So both the father and the son. See, the, the, the son is following right in the father's uh, footsteps. Now, Jacob, I don't know about you, but as a father, he should have been upset and not even considered this. He should have just rebuked him, or maybe this could have started a war. He says, but the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and Hamor, his father, and spoke deceitfully because he had defiled Dinah, their sister. And they said to them, We cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised, for that would be a reproach to us. Now, see, th this is where they're going to get religious on them. See, all of the Jews were circumcised. And so all of the people of Shechem were not. They were not believers in God. So the sons, they make a plan here. They say, this is what's going to... They spoke deceitfully. Say deceitfully. And they said, if you'll get circumcised, and all the men of your, your people will get circumcised... How many of y'all know what circumcision is? Wave at me. So we, 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 y'all know. And now we're not talking about baby circumcision here. We're talking about men getting circumcised. You know, we say that in Bible, ay, ay, ay. I mean, this is a commitment, okay? Shechem's going to come back and he's going to go to the gate and tell all the men, I love this girl and I love her so much that all of y'all guys are going to have to get circumcised. And they're going to say, what? He, and, but he, he, you read the story. He goes and he says, all y'all get circumcised and this is what's going to happen. What's going to end up happening, they're going to give us their daughters, and we're going to give them our daughters, but we're going to end up buying, and we're going to end up getting their livestock and their cattle and everything. We're going to end up with all their possessions. So he's kind of manipulating them, making a deal with the men of the land to try to talk them in to getting circumcised, all because this boy wants something. 
And he's so used to getting what he wants, it doesn't matter the cost. He's going to get what he wants no matter what. Talk about spoiled. And we talk about spoiling our daughters. This father spoiled his son. How many of you know there's some spoiled men in this world? There should get a better amen than that. Well, I was talking about the little girls being spoiled, but there's some spoiled sons. I ain't going to name any that I know. And spoiled daughters. But they spoke deceitfully. And it says, whenever he said that, it says that Shechem said he was willing to do this thing. Say this thing. So to him, it was just a thing that he had to do to get what he wanted. Had nothing to do with the meaning of what the thing was really all about. This thing called circumcision that he was fixing to do was one of the most religious acts that a man could do in making covenant with God. In fact, every man that was going to enter into a covenant relationship with God in those days had to do that to enter into the covenant relationship. He had to shed blood from the private part of his body so that he could enter into a blood covenant with Almighty God. And it was not just a thing to be done to get what you want. And whenever you enter into a blood covenant with God with G- through Jesus' blood, it's not just a thing you do just to get what you want from God. us spoiled Americans and spoiled people in this world we want to do the Christian thing so that we can get what we want from God to get what we want what we want and we're not denying ourselves we're not dying we're not taking up our cross in this journey called Christianity we're being just like Shechem we'll do this thing so that I can get what I want Y'all know what this thing is? It's the cutting away of the unnecessary flesh in one of the most private reproductive areas of a man's life. You know what that represents? Allowing God to take away that unnecessary fleshly thing in you that you don't need to, it to be cut out of your heart. It's really a picture of today's Christian is the circumcision of the heart. To cut away your fleshly nature, that sinful nature, that part of you that's hidden in the depths of your heart, that intimate area of your life that you don't let anybody else go, but you need to let God go there so He can cut away all that fleshly junk that's keeping you from getting intimate with Him. So when we talk about the circumcision, whenever you talk about that through the Bible, circumcision represented the Jews' covenant with God. That's how they entered into their salvation covenant with God. So there's a deep meaning to this. But what happened right here is the sons of Jacob don't even understand it themselves because if they would have understood it, they would have not even attempted to do this. This was not a good thing that Jacob's sons decided to use religious law to deal deceitfully. You ever known anybody to use the Bible to deal deceitfully with people, to take advantage of them? Amen? Oh, let me tell you, it goes something like this. If you send a thousand dollars, God will pay off your debt on your credit card. Just get the same credit card that you got the debt on and charge it and send me the $1,000. And in 30 days, God's going to pay off your credit card debt. I feel them. You ever seen them on TV? They're using the covenant of God deceitfully. For their own advantage. And they don't even understand that Jesus did not die on the cross for you to make a deal with God by a thousand dollar exchange to get what you need. God will give you what you need because you believe in Him and your faith is the medium of exchange. That's what believing God and His grace and His mercy brings to you whatever God has for you. And then when you pray and you believe God for something and it doesn't happen the way you want, you still don't have a right to be upset. Because we know you're supposed to keep loving God because all things work together for the good for them that love God and to those that are called according to His purpose. Now can you imagine, I would come here to all the men, and let's say all, all the men of this church was, were, were, were uh, like Shechemites or whatever you'd call them. From Shechem. 
And I've come back and said, listen, I met Mary. She is fine. I want her. But the only way I can get her is if all you guys get circumcised. They go, oh, we're having us a meeting. Are you sure this is love? Amen. I mean, the best man barely wants to buy his own tuxedo. Much let's get, you know, come on. You want me to be the best man? How much that tuxedo is going to cost me to walk next to you in that wedding? Do you see the depth of the meaning here, but how shallow it became? And the depth of the meaning of who we are in Christ and the word of God and the covenant we have with God. And then how shallow it comes. And we use it to condemn people instead of to save people. We bring the law out on people instead of bringing the grace to people. It's like I was talking about the legalistic people that want to measure the skirts, measure the, the hair, the sleeves, the, you know, pack of Marlboros or, you know, how much wine can you drink before you sin? And, and oh, I saw him over there and she was coming out of there and, oh, shut up. You're never going to get anybody saved always looking at the law. Excuse me being brass like that. You need to bring them to a loving relationship with Jesus Christ. Because with the same judgment you judge, it will be judged back to you. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 and following. So what happens is these guys all agree to be circumcised. And every one of them coming through the gate has to be circumcised. Can you imagine the day that you have to walk through that gate? You're looking at that gate and say, I don't know. But okay, the prince wants it, the king wants it, and we're going to do it. Now, the only way they could confirm that you were circumcised is, is, you know, they had to confirm it. So this is a humiliating thing also. Do you know that humiliation is not bad when it's tied into humbling yourself to God? Yeah. Amen. So when you really truly surrender all of your junk to God, all of that unnecessary flesh in the most hidden areas of your life, it can be humiliating to you, but at the same time it's liberating Amen. when it's done in the true meaning of what it is. Amen. It's called the circumcision of the heart. The New Testament changes it from natural circumcision to an inward circumcision. A cutting away of the, the hardness and the hard things of our hearts so that the Holy Spirit can begin to lead us and guide us. All these men get circumcised three days later. And it says when they're in pain. Say pain. pain. Men say amen. amen. It says that two of the sons of Jacob take swords and they go into Shechem and they kill Shechem, Hamor, and all of the men. Then the rest of the brothers go in and pick up the spoils and take everything. They take the children and all of the women to become their servants. They dealt deceitfully with them. Now I'm going to try to wrap this up. There's so much more to this story. Jacob gets upset. You read it. Jacob gets upset with them. Not because they treated the holy thing in an unholy way. He gets upset because of what the neighbors are going to think. Read it at the end. He gets upset because of what the neighbors are going to think. They're gonna, and then he's concerned that now they're going to think wrong about us and they're going to come and kill us. He didn't rebuke them because they lost the true meaning of walking with God. And some of y'all and some of us and some of the people watching on TV, you're more concerned about what people think about you than doing what's right. So you don't always do what's right because you're afraid of what people are going to think. Amen. Dinah should have never went into Shechem to start with. She should have never compromised herself to be defiled. And it's because they were too close to the world. And I know we're in the world, but not of the world. Amen. So now we got to realize that these things that they were doing in the natural is something that we now do in the spiritual. 
Because you're going to go to work and you're going to be around worldly people. The world is all around you, but you're not of the world. And you've got to learn how to keep yourself separated from the world through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives on the inside of you. Amen. And I don't care if he's a prince. I don't care if he's got big wheels and the best chariot and he owns the land. It's not worth giving up the purity that God has given you. Now see, we, some people want to say we're, we're talking about natural it talks about natural. But the purity you have once you're born again, that being washed in the water of the Word, the sins being forgiven in your life, becoming a holy, pure, justified, born-again, spirit-filled Christian, it's not worth giving up that holiness for the world. Amen. I'm not going back to the world. Jacob, you could come forward. Put your stuff down. The next scripture you know by heart as I lead you to close. It's Romans 3.23 that says what? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now how many have sinned? All. I've raised both hands and a foot. All. Some of y'all knew me before Christ. I sinned, I enjoyed sinning. Didn't know how to do much of anything else. Amen? Amen? Now, do y'all know that they've done studies and they say if they put a man or a woman in a place where there's no sun or anything and, and tell them to walk in a straight line, that they always walk in a circle? It's a study. You will always walk in a circle unless you have something to measure off of. But when the sun would come out, they would begin to walk straight. When the clouds would come again and they would lose their barren because there was no clouds, you would walk in a circle. Do we have any hunters in here? You ever walked in a circle in your hunt? Oh, yeah. I shot a squirrel one time. I walked for two hours and I stopped and I looked. I said, but that stump looks familiar. <laughs> I looked down. My shell was still on the ground. I said, I thought I was getting closer to the camp. It was cloud and foggy and rainy that day, and I, I walked in a perfect circle. Now, you know, when it says to sin, sin doesn't just mean rebellion against God. It means to not be able to walk straight with God, to miss the mark. And if we don't have something to measure off of, we'll find ourselves walking in a circle too. Guess what these old boys were doing right here? Instead of going straight to the promised land, they were circling. They circled around. The children of Israel circled around Egypt for 40 years. When all they had to do was walk straight into the promised land. Jesus Christ is the marker that we measure our lives off of. He's the only true thing to compare yourself to. Don't compare yourselves among yourselves, but compare yourself to Him. If you've never asked Him to be the Lord of your life, to be the light of your life, to be that grounding force on the inside of you, before you leave today, I want you to ask Him into your heart and into your life. Knowing about Jesus, even believing He existed, and even knowing that He died on the cross doesn't mean that you're saved. You have to actually ask Him to save you. Ask Him to come into your heart and into your life. If you've never done that today, I want you to get out of your chair. Not join the church, but join Jesus. I want you to get up right now. Don't hesitate. Get up and come down right now. Let me pray with you. Come just as you are. Come right now and let Jesus come into your heart and into your life. Do we have anybody today? Your heart may be racing. You say, you know, I know I need to give my life to Jesus. It's only been a head thing for me, but now I want him in my heart. I always say this. Don't let your head keep you where your heart wants to take you. If your heart is wanting to take you to this altar, get up right now. Don't hesitate. You say, Pastor, why do you want them to come up publicly? Because Jesus said, if you confess me publicly, I'll confess you before my Father and the angels. But he says, if you don't, if you deny me, I'll deny you. Don't be ashamed of Jesus Christ. He's here to help you, to deliver you. Praise the Lord. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. 
But the most important question is, is Jesus Christ the Lord of your life? I want to ask you, do you know that if you would die right now that you would go to heaven? Have you really put your faith in the finished work of what Jesus did on the cross for you? It's very simple what the scripture says about being saved. It says that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, that you shall be saved. So today, why don't you take time to stop right now and ask Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life. Simply pray a prayer like this. Say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of all of my sins. I know that you died on the cross for me, that you was buried and that God raised you from the dead. And today I ask you to be my Lord and my Savior. I receive forgiveness of my sins today. Thank you for saving me. Now, my friend, if you just prayed that prayer from your heart, that means you are now a son or a daughter of God. Get in a good Bible-believing church. There's several great churches in our community that will serve you. You need to get into the Word of God and grow as a Christian. Don't just stop with that one prayer. Keep on going. And I want to thank you again for watching our broadcast. Remember, God knows everything about you and loves you anyway.